Hello everybody, it's Kamal Fernandez from Kamal Fernandez Dog Training with an interview with somebody that is going to be really, really interesting to have this discussion. So those of you that follow me on Facebook, YouTube and obviously SoundCloud on my podcast have heard me talk to various people in the dog training world and dog sports world specifically on a variety of subjects from um, online dog training to reactivity and the broad spectrum of um, things that we could the topics in between. Today I'm talking with Emily Birch who is a lecturer at Hartbury University and a clinical behaviorist who has a really really interesting and diverse uh, professional career uh, looking at topics that have actually shaped the way in which dogs sports currently operate. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. The conversation's going to be about our own experiences as relatively new parents and the parallels and learnings that we've taken um, that can be applied to dog ownership and specifically dog owners across the globe. So thank you, Emily and Em, as you like to be referred to, um, for your time and your insight. Um, we had a conversation which was really, really, really interesting last week, which we'll tap on later on. So just tell us a little bit about yourself um, and obviously your background so people watching know who you are. So I think you kind of tapped on it earlier. So I'm quite diverse what I did. So I have a little research hat, I have a lecturing hat and I have a behaviorist hat. Um, and I intermix between all three. Um, so I have worked as a lecturer for overall for the past six, four years at Nottingham Trent University. Now I'm at Hartbury University. Um, I've run my own behaviorist company, so Emily Birch Counter Consultancy, for around three years now. Um, and within my lecturing role, I've also done lots of research. So that's how I started lecturing, really, was mm -hmm. I started working at universities to do research. I, I enjoy all of them equally. And I think that's why it works quite well sitting in the different camps, because research obviously feeds into teaching, and all of my teaching also feeds into my behavior stuff and it all it all interlinks quite nicely. So that's why it work, how it works, really. Yeah. So just to give us a little bit about your background then. So obviously, I met you years ago because you, you were an agility um, competitor. Um, so how did your do interest in dog training specifically or behaviour start then? Um, it, so I have always wanted dogs ever since I was really young, um, every Christmas. And in fact, a while back, I found a Christmas list, a father Christmas list, <laughs> from probably when I was about five or six. And number one was a dog, number two was a horse. Well, then I, I think I got horse, smaller. I dog thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, could never have a dog. So my dad was very allergic to dogs. So that was one of the kind of my mum's get out of jail car. I shouldn't have to have a family dog. Um, my dad actually died when I was 13, 14. Um, oh. And I think within a week, probably one of my first questions was, can we get a dog? Well, um, I and saw you took the morning well, then really, you know. Exactly. We're all about grief in different ways, Em. We're not going to judge. <laughs> exactly. And I think uh, probably talk about hitting your mum when they're down. The, uh, and that's how we, my mum said yes, and we went to a rescue shelter. And that is how we came across Evie, who, hand on heart, was the best dog ever. I think a lot of us who are now in the dog training world had our first dog was like this absolute soulmate who just came along and kind of saved us and yeah. and really showed us like different ways mm -hmm. and so and this is going back to 2002 and we went to puppy classes I mean she was an older dog but we went to classes and all of this and I remember one time we had a really great relationship me and Evie like we just were good friends so um what sort of dog was that then Em? So she was an absolute kind of Heinz 57 but people said to me she looked like a smaller, all brown Doberman, right. but she behaved very spanielly. She was a real scent dog. Right. Um, and she was as naughty as they came. Um, I mean, so naughty. I've written blogs all about how she got me into training. And I, we'd probably had her about six months. And right. someone who was a good family friend, um, she was a real cat chaser. So the minute she was off lead, she was off like chasing cats yep. and just being naughty. Yep. And this person said to me, and I think I was probably quite upset. I was also quite young. I was, I'd be, so I'd have still been 14. Um, yeah. And I said, oh, I don't know how to stop her chasing cats. Mm -hmm. And the woman said to me, when she comes back, hold her collar and smack her on the nose. And I remember thinking, well, that doesn't feel very oh, nice. I, yeah, but yeah. because someone in a position, and this is always, this is probably a, very much where my yeah. teaching side has come from. Yeah. Because it was a person in a position of power, power I totally respected what they said. And knowledge, yeah, you assume, yeah. So when she came back, I held onto her collar and I remember smacking her on the nose and I just remember her face changing and it was like this whole 
you're my friend and you've just done something really horrible to me oh, and this and i remember thinking this is not the way there's got to be another way and i think that's probably where it started mm. um i used to then we got into agility so i used to walk a mile and a half uphill so i live in the bottom of a valley mm -hmm. used to walk a mile and a half uphill train evie for an hour and then walk back down um Bless the age of kind of 14 15 um and then we got, and that's kind of where it started. So she definitely kicked it all off. Um, I then did my undergrad degree in animal behaviour and welfare at Hartbury. Mm -hmm. And then after finishing that, I went up to Lincoln. And I did my master's in clinical animal behaviour. And then I, that's kind of where I am now. Um, right. As in, sorry, I've graduated from that, but that's, that's where I, how I got to where I got And Lincoln's to. very, very well respected in, you know, in, in that world and um, has a lot of very, very affluent and um, um, prominent professors that speak there and lecturers, isn't it? So it's a very, very well thought of um, university. So that, you know, huge kudos to you for doing your master's there. Yeah, it was definitely like an initiation of fire. I remember semester one, I don't think there's anyone who didn't shed some tears at the workload. Uh -huh. It was uh, yeah. tough, but it was good. And I'm really pleased I did it. Yeah. Um, and we were taught by both Daniel Mills and Helen, um, yeah. both have been really influential in probably who I've become um, yeah. and how I train and all those sorts of things. So, yeah. Isn't it interesting, isn't it, that I think a lot of people in, certainly myself, I had a sim very similar path in that, you know, I went to a dog training with a dog. My dog wasn't like yours. She was, wasn't so forgiving. And, and, but she, it was the same experience. And I think they're definitely the similar um, outcome as you. And I, as teachers and as um, professionals, we have a huge sense of responsibility because somebody is, handing over the reins to you and a lot of trust in your judgment your 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 training ability your ability to read the dog your you know your post um consultation uh, support etc cetera, etc cetera. and i and as i say it really is uh, you know when you actually evaluate that dynamic they you know you, at times you know you have people that you think gosh they you know and um as you said, you, you put your trust in that person. If they tell you to jump off a cliff, you're going to do it if you think that's going to work. And I think that really is something that's key to uh, for all of us that are professional in this industry to bear that in mind that somebody, and often people come to us in a real state of, um, you know, dis, uh, uh, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Sort of um, discontent or upset or pain or stress or anxiety. So they're very vulnerable. And I think we have a, a duty to, to respect and honour that when we interact and help them. And one of the things I always say when I first begin consults is nothing that you can say will offend me yeah. and nothing you've done is wrong because so many people, hide, not, not kind of deliberately, but they'll, they'll keep stuff back, which is really important to know yeah. because actually the fear of being judged and I'm genuinely, I'm pretty unflappable in that you, you could pretty much tell me anything yeah. and I, I will not judge people. Yeah. Um, and that's really important to me. And I did... When I was teaching at NTU, I did a short course on what's called humane education. And yeah. that was absolutely eye opening for me. I kind of think everyone should look at that. And it's how we create behavior change and how if you tell somebody they're wrong, you will just put up defenses and they will sit yeah, in that, that yeah. kind of camp. Yeah. If you nurture and demonstrate and show and it's yeah. a way more gentle, and it takes much longer time. But actually you start changing. They create their own behavior change. So they yeah. say, well, actually this does really work no, and by not saying no you're wrong you can't do it like that you massively will you'll start to then change behavior much better Absolutely. isn't it funny that we you know i had this real paradigm shift in my own experience as a professional in that um whilst i made the transition if you want to call it that to training positively or however you know the spectrum of whatever that is reinforcement based dog training with my dogs i trained and i was like yep i'm gonna do this but with the people i was teaching i was I absolutely did not have that level of compassion. And it was a real, there was a couple of definite people that shaped my behavior and made me really appreciate that. Like you say, if you are just holding a rod over their back and making them do things, you're going to cause them to shut down exactly like you would a dog. But now like I, you know, my mantra is teach a man to fish, sorry, give a man a fish, you'll eat for a day, teach him to fish, you'll eat. And that's how I operate and how I teach. But also I'm, you know, I'm again, we're all persons of evolution, but I'm a much more empathetic, um, compassionate teacher. And, and um, in, in now because of those um, uh, experiences I had early in my career. Now, that's not to say with, you know, I'm not going to say, 
that's not good enough, you need to do better, etc. Because I think there's a balance between being truthful and honest and helping the person move forward, right? We need to come and we need to sort this, you need to put some work in, etc. But also, and this is a great thing I learned from Denise Spenzi, saying in a way that's with the right intentions, you know, not to pull them down. You can say to somebody, you need to put more work in or you're not doing that correctly. But you can say in a way that's delivered from a place of compassion and kindness. And if you allow that to steer you, I think that you won't go far wrong, really. Yeah. And I think that's really important. It's totally important. Yeah. Um, and we know all of that from kind of, you don't have to do much kind of reading on human psychology to learn about behaviour change and all of this. Um, but yeah, that gentle nudge effect rather than Absolutely. I am right, you are wrong, you've Absolutely. got to do it my way. Yeah, and again, coming back to that paradigm dynamic, it's, you know, to be truthful, it can sometimes, especially I think if you're young in, not young necessarily, but new in this industry, it can be quite an alluring drug to have that power. And I think that that can sometimes be, you know, in truth can be susceptible to exploitation, where, you know, it's a little bit of a power kick that people are hanging on your every word. But for me, the, the thing is that I've definitely learned is, you know, as I say, you have a duty of care. You are in, you are stepping into people's very, um, very intimate parts of their life in terms of their dog ownership. And, you know, you are dealing with a member of their family, you know, and it is that way. And you're also going to touch on that within the midst of dealing with their behavioral issues. Certainly you're going to bring up stuff that is deep rooted within them. And I think that you have to deal with that with, a, with respect and as I say, compassion and kindness. Um, and I think as, as a result of that, you will be a, a, a trainer and a person that will, you know, attract the right energy and, yeah. and move forward in that way as well. And I think even almost sometimes almost deeper than that, I've had um, couples in, in, so I've had behavior consults that have been with couples and whole families yeah. and the, how the dog has changed the dynamic. And I, mm -hmm. I kind of have lived with it. And I think having lived through it, it's made me a lot more appreciative in that. So my other half has always had dogs, yeah. um, spent many years in Africa um, as a child, always had dogs, but definitely dogs were do as I say, do as I do. Yeah came from quite a different school of thought yeah. and I've had to do because I want to get really defensive and be like no we don't trip because it's my other half you can yeah. I'm very different yeah. and I want to kind of be like quite lectury and dictatory yeah. and be like this is how we do it because I know more than you yeah it definitely taught me that actually again that's not the way to do it but also how personal relationships can be hugely affected by dogs and this is also something that we have to play play like be a part of yeah, yeah. I'm sure you've had the experience and I know have that the dog is, you know, funny enough, I went to somebody this week, the dog becomes almost, and often with certainly behavioral issues, it can become a real um, straw that broke the camel's back. Now it might not be that the dog was the catalyst for, you know, issues, but often the dog can, you know, to be a, a real trigger point for both, for all parties. It can be, you know, the kids love the dog, but the dog's left with the mum and the dog's the point of frustration for the mum. The dad's out at work. And that's a very classic dynamic that you're, the dog, you know, everybody wanted the dog and they were all cutesy when it was pup fluffy, but then when they, or when cutesy wootsy and tiny, then it becomes a problem and it's left to the person who's the main person at home to deal with. And again, that um, that's a very common thing. So that becomes a source of stress, et cetera, et cetera. So I absolutely, I think that we need to be mindful that, you know, to treat people with a way, as I say, that is not a case of do as I do, but supporting them and being compassionate and empathetic to their position. Yeah. yeah. It's really interesting you're talking about, um, let's say, okay. It's really interesting you say about, um, you know, touching on the subject of specifically your partner, having a difference of opinion and how you've learned to, you know, come at that a different way and I think that's a really valuable point to just reiterate I think that should be applicable to not just spouses but to anybody that has a differing opinion from us I think that I would say I'm opinionated I'm sure that you are strong in our stance and our beliefs but it's also being respectful that you know there is a difference of opinion and it's not to say that opinion is necessarily wrong it might differ from mine um but there's many paths to the you know the um to take but it's like you say if you are withholding you're not having judgment and you're opening uh, coming from a place as I say of um where you're willing to communicate and see their point and perhaps you know make some suggestions i think that we'd be far better off i think that sometimes we all get in our little tribes really and it can be a little bit you know combative. Yeah. yeah and it's almost like sometimes i see with really kind of um well-known trainers that it almost becomes a bit of a gob complex in a sense and yeah. that whatever they say becomes gospel yeah. and then there's this like little following of people who will just take it as word and like you were saying that must be quite a powerful feeling but again i think that needs to be 
and I think that's where social media plays a big part. I'm always a bit funny about social media. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I yeah. think that my take on it is somebody that obviously, you know, is, um, has a social media following and I'm prominent on social media and I um, use it as part of the way in which I operate and engage with my audience. I'm very aware of the responsibility that comes with that. And um, it, it would be very easy to, you know, when you are having people that are, um, you know, in a place of uh, vulnerability to exploit that for your own gains. And I think for both the monetary um, reasons and also from a, um, you know, as I say, a, a morality issue, because of the person I am, I'm very, I'm very conscious of that. And that isn't how I choose to be. But I absolutely understand that that is something that I think is quite prevalent. Even truthful, it's quite prevalent in our industry. And I think the way that it's going. And I think just to reiterate the point that, every, you know, you should, for me, it's, it's the moral and ethical question of it. And I think it's about having, um, you know, an understanding and, and appreciation that we have a sense of, um, we do have that power dynamic and there is, with that comes, as I say, great responsibility to quote Spider-Man. But um, yeah, I think it's something to be worth bearing in mind. One of my favourite quotes, um, and actually it was a student who said it to me and I was like, that is genius, um, is the emptiest drum beats the loudest. And yeah. I, I quite often use that in, and if I talk to, when people ask, well, how do I find a good trainer or this? Because I think it's brilliant that people like yourself have lots of like social media following. So actually the good information is getting out there yeah. um and I, so, um, when so when people say but i always think you can kind of spot if somebody says so that empty drum beats the loudest if yeah. they only see one viewpoint if it's absolutely this is the way there's no other way and it's all black and white i think yeah. you can start to argue they might not know yeah. the same amount yeah. um so yes and i think that is it's that responsibility yeah um and i think there's also this We've almost done dogs a disservice in a sense in mm -hmm. the kind of mainstream media in that man's best friend, a dog's a man's best friend, mm -hmm. in that when a dog is a dog, because by very nature it is a dog, so it's rolling in fox poo mm -hmm. or it's chasing rabbits and it won't come back or all of this, people almost loathe them because what they've got is their best friend and their yeah. best friend is not behaving like a best friend, it's behaving like a dog. Absolutely. And I think it's almost gone too far Absolutely. in that get a dog is your best friend, but actually dogs are still dogs yeah yeah absolutely and i think that funny enough that's a really interesting point um so uh, as you're aware i did a talk recently on the um uh, on frustration and stress resilience in dog training which is how our uh, this conversation actually evolved to and uh, the so as an industry i think that we've taken a real journey in from more <coughs> compulsion about a, a aversive based dog training and dominance based theory that you had to be the pack leader and you had to show the dog who it's boss and that you were boss and the dog had to do it because you've told it to um let's reward them for good behavior and you know ignore the bad behavior and say bad ignore the bad stuff and reward the good stuff and all will be well and actually in truth neither extreme ends of the spectrum are actually in truth 100 percent correct that there is a place in I'd say not even in the middle, but that is slightly off center. That probably is about where I sit in terms of, you know, I am a reinforcement based dog trainer, but there is lines in which I live my life with my dogs. I think that, you know, the concept of frustration and stress and coming back to your point about there's many opinions and talking about social media. So uh, that when you put your head above the parapet, you are susceptible for comment. And, and as somebody in your industry, when you put out your, your work, you are, people are going to look at it, they're going to agree with it, they're going to critique it, they're going to criticize it. You have to learn to have a level of resilience to people criticizing your work and challenging it. And that to me is how we all grow and move forward. Science is a great example of that. You know, if you look at the, um, the it, say just dog training alone, you know, how it has evolved the science and continually challenging and, and the norm. And no, I don't agree with that thinking. Let's see if I can, you know, and challenge it. And I think that dog rearing, dog ownership, dog training has definitely been sub subject to that um, mindset of um, let's, let's ch not, I think there's something to be that people just accept it without actually thinking, is there validity in this thinking? Can I, can I do this better? And, and certainly when it comes to stress and frustration and the, um, the, one of the points that I made about stress and frustration is that it, we've, there's a very strong belief system. And I, I, my personal perspective is that it's come from the zoological influence uh, uh, within animal training or, um, and the stress and frustration, how it, an animal shouldn't be stressed. Uh, sorry, an animal shouldn't be subjected to stress and frustration unnecessarily. 
And I absolutely believe, yes, for captive wild animals that are already stressed by that environment, absolutely. Unfortunately for us, our dogs on a daily basis are going to be subjected to stress and frustration. And as dog owners and dog trainers and behaviorists and professionals, all the weird and wonderful things that we are called, if we don't do some work on creating a level of resilience and frustration, um, I think that we are doing them a disservice. Yeah, and I think that kind of that probably brings us on to our child dog discussion. But Absolutely. it's it's pretty it's quite well researched in students looking at resilience. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, cohorts of students, if you're going to go by um, subject, cohorts of students that seem to have bucket loads of resilience are sports overall but particularly equine sports mm. and i think when you think about it if you're a child and you have a pony or you're a teenager and you have a horse or whatever you get up every day at the crack of dawn you're oh. out in the dark the mud the wind the rain yeah. you're constantly failing for want of a better word so you work your absolute socks off <coughs> and you'll go to a competition and you'll come last because your horse doesn't want to do what you've trained it to do all of this sort of stuff you either can give up or you can crack on and i think what it creates well, it, it creates, so, um, and funny enough, I actually printed out a poster to put on our fridge. So we're currently living in, at my mum's house between, between moves. And I stuck on the fridge, open mindset versus fixed mindset. Because I think, particularly our generation, but I think I can be quite bad for falling into a fixed mindset, when actually what we want to create is really open mindset. So when you fail and it goes wrong, you just use it your brain automatically goes well that's a great opportunity to learn how can i do that better yep. as opposed to oh god that failed i'm useless i'm not going to try it again yep. and i think that's what we, well and that's what we want to teach to our dogs really isn't it that open absolutely i think that's a, a huge part of so um you know we were discussing in our conversation um prior to this one how and both of us as young parents have um how our evolution is dog owners, dog trainers, dog behaviorists, whatever you want to call us, has um, been reiterated or affirmed in our child rearing. And, and although we're both, Emily has, we're, uh, how old's your little girl? Just turned two. Just turned two and she's got another one on the way. Um, yeah, so uh, good luck with that one. Uh, <laughs> two, two kids under two or two or kids under three, but that's gonna need a lot of stress and frustration with Zillian. Yeah, 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 I think mostly from me. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> So it's really interesting how we can, obviously there's a lot of parallels between the skills that we need to give our children are the skills that we would want to equip with our dogs. But yet with dogs, we don't seem to ready them quite as, um, as well as the, the way in which we is now accepted, I think standard um, for do dogs, uh, sorry, for, for children. So I think there's a, there has been a shift in terms of um, children that we need to create stress and frustration resilience um we you know you can't keep your child in this safety bubble for the rest of their life and expect them to then go out in the world and be um a confident outgoing adult and the irony is that i don't think we're quite as proficient with our dog training and, and if i'm honest i think that's a little bit of positive training and and you know we must never let our dog fail we must never let them forget frustrated reduce frustration and stress at all costs and in my opinion, I think that's a disservice to them. How, what are your thoughts on it, Emily? It's a huge disservice because that also isn't real. Um, because you'll, that, you'll take your dog, let's say that you create this absolute bubble where it's all safe, everything's hunky-dory. I can guarantee there will be some point in your dog's life where it won't be hunky-dory and it won't be great. And actually, if you haven't given the tools to cope with that, that'll become a really massive thing. Yeah. And I think the ability... And I suppose, and here's where kind of the research is lacking, is how do we scientifically, are we creating frust better frustration tolerance? Are we creating more emotional resilience? Or is this just what we think? But for me, especially as puppies, I think a big part of, for me with puppies is that we, I just teach them life. Life with me yeah. is going to be full of this, that yes, sometimes I will drop stuff out of the cupboard. Um, oopsie, that's not very nice, but you know, it, it's over in a second and things yeah. carry on. Um, and I, I do have pretty resilient dogs, um, whether that's who they are in naturally. And I think some dogs will naturally defer that already. But I think fair point, yeah. because not everything, all of my training, everything that I do in that regard is positive based. Um, yeah. And I teach them what I want. But there are times and especially I think since having when I had a newborn baby, my dogs are horrendous and barking at the door. Yeah. Um, 
and it was always on my, oh, I really should train this. I really should stop the barking, but it kind of, I never really did it and I never really got around to it. So instead, when I had a newborn baby and I was absolutely exhausted, when they went bonkers at the door and she was asleep, what was my answer? I did shout at them. Yeah. I did shout at them to be quiet and it did work. Yeah. They did be quiet. They did stop barking. And then after be like, oh, that was great. Thank you for stopping. And I was aware of my own behavior, but I think that's also, they never really seemed to care. And I think that's part of actually, we have to acknowledge that we are humans. Absolutely. Um, and I think there's this kind of almost notion within people who are positive reward based fundamental can I say fundamentalists? Like the people who are the extreme level of it. Yeah. See any negative shouting yeah. at your dog yeah. or or anything like that would see it as a real, well, you're not a nice person. Mm. Um, and I, but I don't think it's that at all because especially now I have a toddler who might, well, you'll know, when they get annoyed and frustrated, which can be over anything, it's loud and it's unpredictable. Yeah, yeah. But actually my dogs don't seem to care yeah. because there's a level of, well, I've dropped stuff like they've heard shouting before not like horrendous i mean everything's yeah. within a level obviously yeah. yeah um but that's just life sometimes yeah. i'll go on a walk and i'll meet a horrible dog sometimes i'll meet a person who's a bit inappropriate and i'll hug them all those sorts of things yeah, yeah. and i think the, the 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 point to make is i don't when those things happen i don't rush out and go right i need to counter condition it i need to desensitize it i need to get get a stringent plan and you know move the dist i just go it happens you know that's that's the way the go the cookie crumbles i know it isn't you know the best thing that happened you got jumped on by a dog c'est la vie i'm going to do a bit of socialization with a dog that if i can get access to another dog that looks similar hallelujah great chances are i'm not i'm never going to see that dog again and neither will you and we're going to just move through our life and be absolutely fine and i think that's a really really um great point to make that everything doesn't have to be this stringent training plan per se it, yes obviously it depends on the extremities as you've said if you're you know if something extreme like a firework goes off and your puppy's yeah. out the garden yeah of course you're going to do something about that but if like you say you open a cupboard can of beans falls on the floor bangs on the ground oh well never mind pick it up go about your business i'm not going to try and train my dog etc you know just on that point so i think obviously there's a, there's a genetic influence as you said some dogs are naturally that way but when hottie who is my 10 month old puppy um, was uh, eight weeks old. Um, Lois took her to her parents' house and it just so happened there, that she has it on video, she was feeding her in the garden and there was an, an apps, I think, I can't remember if it was one of the neighbours or something, anyway, made a loud bang. She freaks, hits the end of the lead, she's on a harness, absolutely like has a little meltdown. Um, and I, I wasn't there, Lois had the dog. I was like, you know, and she came back and told me a little bit like, oh God, you know, and I was uh, a bit like guilty about, oh gosh, you know, she, and I was like, oh, she'll be fine. And sure as eggs, she's fine. I did nothing about it. I never trained it. I never, because one, she's genetically got a sound temperament. And I, there was no, the dog, she was in that, she was eight weeks, which is a good time. If anything's going to happen, they're probably going to dust it off. You know, she wasn't in that real fear period. I went, oh, well, never mind. Life happens. And tr sure as eggs are eggs, she's got a, a fantastic temperament and she's not noise sensitive at all. But it, there is something to be said about not jumping in there with our size tens and, and going, oh my God, I have a problem. I need to do this, this, and this. In actual fact, you could probably make it 10 times worse. Yeah, yeah. And I think, and, and I think one of the ways that you could, could probably really neatly scientifically test this would be looking at pet owners or, or pet, pet dogs and yep. trainers dogs. Because I think, and I remember I said this to you last week, that I was driving through town recently and there was a mum with three small children. So like about three, two and one, like all small, close together. And they had a puppy, a Springer Spaniel puppy on a harness. Walking along, there was one of those road signs and the puppy was like, whoa, what is this? properly like not really freaking out but was like i'm a bit worried about this yeah. mum didn't notice because she's got three children near a road they're obviously her priority so she carries on walking by the time the puppy had gone past it was like oh cool had a little body shake carried on yeah. and i thought as trainers and behaviorists we might have thought then okay we need to step in with food we need to do okay they're a bit yeah. scared of signs let's do some work around signs but actually are pet pet dogs yeah. more resilient potentially because of genetics that they're bred from different totally different kind of lines and, and breeding stock but or is it because actually pet owners they'll drop the tin of beans won't think twice about the dog and carry on and actually then the world's moved on everything else has happened and the dog's forgotten about it yeah. Yeah. um yeah and i think that that's where that whole stepping in and yeah and being too okay my dog's showing a slight fear response to a big black labrador i'm going to do loads of work near big black labs until the dog goes mm, 
yeah, there is something to think about there <laughs> yeah, because yeah. Yeah. you're doing loads of work at a distance and this has become yeah. a bit of a strange scenario. Yeah, yeah, and dogs will tune into how you're feeling. So if you're getting anxious about it, the dog's going to pick up on that and so forth and so forth. Um, I can't remember if it was you that was telling me about the, um, the was it plants that were grown in the really sterile environment? Was that you that was just with last week? Oh, okay. So um, I, I thought it was you that mentioned about a, a really um, interesting um, comparison talking about stress and stress resilience. So um, there was a, st a study about this particular type of plant. Don't quote me verbatim on this, but the gist of it is this, and I think it's a great analogy for stress and, and frustration. So they had this particular vine or tree or whatever, and they grew this vine or whatever in a, in a very sterile, perfect climate, perfect environment, etc. blah, blah. And what happened, this um, plant or whatever, this tree that would normally be very, very strong and robust and upright would literally flop over and had no, no um, uh, wasn't standing up at all and had no strength in it. And what they discovered was the thing that was very miss that was missing was the wind and the um, rain, exactly, and the environment and, and the, the changes in the stresses in the environment that would cause it to like dig its roots deeper and to have a little bit of resilience and learn to give and move etc and to stabilize itself and as a result of that it would actually grow stronger and i think that's a great parallel talking about stress resilience whilst we can create that sterile environment the very thing that we are saving them from is that you know the strengthening and I, again it's a bit like exercise when you go to the exercise you are mildly stressing your body and your body is learning to recover and becoming stronger obviously if you overexpose your body to stress your body is going to break but if you, by just systematically and strategically adding little bits of stress and, and almost, uh, yeah, pressure on your body, your body's going to get stronger as a result of it. And I think that's a great parallel to a dog's temperament. Um, so another, just on the work that you do, a really, you know, it's very, um, it, it must be a, a huge um, feather in your cap to, sh to be part of a project that has shaped the way a, a, a sport has evolved. So you were part of a project which looked into um, jumping specifically for agility dogs. Um, just tell us a little bit about that, what happened and the subsequent outcome. Yeah, so uh, this is so I first did some jump um, kinematic stuff for my undergrad dissertation. Um, didn't do it for my postgrad because there's no supervisor um, within that field. and It was more behaviour based. But then I picked it back up when I went to Nottingham Trent. So we have looked at jump distances. Um, and jump height. Um, so when I was at Nottingham Trent, I was funded for two years, I was funded by the Kennel Club on a big external project. Mm -hmm. Some of it looking at jumping, some of it looking at kind of human dog interactions and all that sort of stuff. Um, but what we, we basically, so we looked at the minimum distance at the time was 3.6 meters and we looked at the maximum distance. So sorry, we looked at the FCI minimum distance, which was five meters. Um, and we basically compared those and what we found was and this is kind of where I sit probably in a slightly different camp so what we found is that at 3.6 meters dogs new dogs struggle experienced dogs don't um they have to massively collect their stride pick up and pop themselves over a little another jump yeah. young dogs would just go underneath would knock poles can't do it but experienced dogs could um and one of the things that I think we need to, and one of the, I sometimes wonder where agility is going. So, and then we've also done work on jump heights, but because for me, we don't change jump height and we don't change, all we change really is course. Everything else is static. Um, and I think if you compare it to horses, you can get a small pony popping around incredibly high fences because my God, that, that individual is talented. Yeah. We don't, and dogs are better jumpers, like biomechanically, they can jump much higher than horses and they can turn much better. Um, and there's a part of me that I think sometimes I wonder, should we be testing the dog's ability to jump? So let's say in a champ class, instead of it just being a really intricate course, should we have three fences at a much smaller distance? And actually ask the dog, can you adjust your speed? Can you collect your strike? Can you pick up? And then can you extend again? And I think that'd be a really neat test because what the study did show is that yes, they can actually. So kind of grade six, seven dogs, they adjusted this totally fine. Yeah. Um, and I think we could be a bit, that would make it almost a bit smarter in how we test individual dogs and handlers. Yeah. Um, but I, I, overall, I totally love the, the increased distance because what you were seeing is you were going to competitions and you'd be in a grade one to three class and it was 
four jumps in a row at 3.6 metres by four jumps in a row at 3.6 metres into a tunnel, there are more jumps at 3.6 metres. And dogs are just, I remember having, I mean, one of my dogs is part donkey, I swear. And watching him on courses like that was just, he was going to break his legs. Yeah. Um, but, and I think that's where you have to have this level of experience with the judges who say no. And this is where I'm totally for the five metres because actually you just don't get that anymore. Yeah. Um, but I think we could be more dynamic in how we assess dogs abilities i think yeah yeah um, so just, uh, just to um further to what em was saying so uh, there was a point in agility those that don't do agility where um there was discussion so at one point the uk the british agility was different to the fci so those of you again that don't know the fci is the governing body for all european um uh, the, all the european kennel club it's the it's the uh, the over uh, the yeah the, the overreaching body that governs all the Europe, so Germany, France, etc. And it's, they all belong to the FCI. So the, the British Kennel Club stands independently of the FCI. We have a, a, a sort of affiliate, I believe, don't quote me on this bit, but an affiliate um, connection with them. So as a result of that, the Kennel Club at a point, we operated differently and our, uh, our jump height was different to the FCI agility jumps. And what happened was a lot of, what was happening was our English dogs were going and our spacings was different. So originally it was four meters minimum, wasn't it? Four meters minimum? Six. Three point, sorry, three yeah, point yeah. six. Sorry, sorry. So three, <coughs> excuse me, 3.6. And in FCI, the minimum was five meters, wasn't it? That's right. So that's a big difference in terms of, you know, lots of factors, speed, jump height, safety, et cetera. So the kennel club, largely driven by the competitors in front, they, they went, you know, we need to, because what was happening is the dogs were performing very differently on our FCI courses. And when they would go abroad, there was definitely a, dif uh, a differentiation between the two things. The dogs were, you know, these were seasoned dogs that had done a lot of competing. They were competing at 3.6, say, for example, and a certain jump height, they would go to Europe or wherever to compete at the world championships and they would have to adjust and, and et cetera. So, that it was looked into as initially the competitors said you know we need to be on par with the fci if we're going to compete with them so it was almost like they were competing at one sport in the uk and then having to go to the to europe or, or yeah europe um and compete totally differently uh, and that was obviously affecting the results etc cetera, etc cetera. so the kennel club and obviously M was involved in a study that looked at you know and collated data and they had an ex vast amount of dogs so how many dogs did you actually get the data from i can't remember now a lot but within but for each dog you assess the three so you look at the middle jump so you are assessing the same jump but you look at neck back shoulder hip wow stifle angles at the landing at the sorry at the takeoff um midpoint of the jump and landing phase of the jump and then the getaway yeah. so it gives you each dog i can't remember what it is i think each dog and you analyze so we had three so each dog i analyzed nine times effectively i think each dog per analysis so per jump gives you about 1080 data points wow wow and i think it was about it was i think it's about 140 dogs wow. but I, that's off the top of my head i mean vast vast amounts of data it took about four months just four months full time every day just analyzing them so wow. what you do get is a pretty nice yeah yeah so the, so so the, obviously as, as there was a huge study done into it and a lot of data as you've just heard and as a result of that that information the kennel club were actually went you know what we're going to change the sport in the uk and the measurements the distance and even some of the equipment has been subsequently removed because i don't think that was down to the study that was because of fci etc um but it just shows how um it how powerful one the voice of the competitors can be to the the value of data and um and actually looking at something um uh, really intensively so i the reason i make this point is that certainly in the sport that i've primarily involved in the obedience is always it's a very subjective sport you know and that's the that's where the problem lies in agility it's you can there's definite like you say um data points that you can look at you know height weight you know distance etc you can there's measurements in obedience is very very subjective uh, and say for example on an exercise like heel work where there's a lot it can be a very controversial top uh, conversation whether you know the angle of the dog's head versus this is appropriate inappropriate 
it's such a complex thing to discuss and actually argue is it right or wrong because the the, the data points are so varied as opposed to something like agility distance distance from the jump how many strides is is numbers that you can actually correlate and, and collate i think them. one of the things is um is that no I, one of the things that massively came out of all the research that we've done, because we, I worked on the two projects as well that looked at obedience head positions and just purely looking at human preference, what are people's preference for positioning, yeah. but yeah. also has it changed over the years? Yeah. But loads of people seem to think that what was happening was we were trying to say this is bad for dogs and that definitely isn't at all. Yeah. Um, and all of our stuff will steer well away from saying what's good or bad. Yeah. It's just saying these are the facts. So what I can tell you is that over 3.6 meters, you get a much more um, varied, so you get much more hyperextension and hypercollection. Yeah. Um, that's not to say that it's good or bad because actually you could argue either way you could say well that repetitiveness could make them more prone to injuries or you could say actually that repetitiveness really strengthens it yeah and they're less likely to get injured yeah we always steer clear unless you're looking specifically at injuries um actually what you're doing is just saying what a preference is how has it changed that sort of stuff yeah and that's the that's the really key thing about i say and a, a correct or, or well a study that's completed correctly in that it shouldn't be there to say good or bad it should just say here's the data what is the conclusion what does the data say and allowing the data to be to lead the point so just out of a point of interest so what was the um you mentioned there about the hillwork study and the data that was what was the 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 data points that you looked at with that and what was the conclusion so it was looking at, so one of them looked at how, so in champ level uh, obedience, yeah. um, how the neck angle has changed and it has become more acute. So basically yeah. what was selected for in the 80s or the yeah. 90s is much more, what's selected for now is much more. The vertical kind of, cap. Um, yeah. yeah. And then the other one was just looking at preferences. So what are people's preferences on leg carriage? So we looked at four legs, hind legs, and again, neck angle. Um, and, it, and actually preferences sat around the middle. People did not select extremes. Yep. They didn't like floppy, loose, head down. Yep. Yep. Um, and bless, so Hannah, who did the study, um, yep. so it was Hannah's post-grad dissertation, that one. I mean, she had to become a whiz kid with the computer. So we basically got Zipper to do a heel work. Um, mm -hmm. And then we manipulated like legs and it was all wow. on Photoshop. Wow. Um, but what, what we got was this really nice data set. Yep. But generally people actually select in the middle. They don't want extremities. Um, yep. And so that was quite nice because what it was saying is actually, yes, the neck angle has changed and has yeah. become more acute yeah. in over the past 30 years, but yeah. actually people individually are selecting in the middle. Um, yeah. And it'd be, I think one of the things that we subsequently thought you should look at is what judges are selecting for um, right. because we just looked at owners. Uh, well, actually we didn't, we didn't extrapolate whether they're judges or owners. Um, we just looked at people who compete, yeah. but I think that could be quite interesting. Um, yeah. But yeah, but none of it. And it was, do you know, it was, it was really funny because we got a lot of backlash from that. Yeah. Because I think people thought we were setting out to be like, oh, you're training for an extreme position. You're a negative, per, like, trainer block. But that wasn't the case at all. And I, think I think, so just on, it's a really interesting discussion point. I'm actually really interested that you brought it up because the, the perception of that study was, it was to say a certain style is right and a certain style is wrong. And the way it wasn't really communicated effectively to the people within the sport that the, actually we're not doing that at all. What we are doing is just looking at what people's preference are and the difference and not to necessarily say this is right and this is wrong. Now, there was a lot of politics around that, that discussion point and heel work can be a very, very controversial uh, exercise when you're talking about preference. Um, and I think that in truth, that the, again, this is a common thing that happens in a lot of um, sports is it was the, the, there wasn't a lot of transparency in, in this, is my opinion, yeah. somebody competes in the sport, there wasn't transparency and that created a level of distrust. And as a result of that, people like all things, there's a case of like, oh, is it this happening? And then you add your little bit and then it becomes this thing, you know, at which it never was. And it's unfortunate that, that the intention and the, the perspective wasn't communicated effectively um, in a way that said, this is all we are doing. There will be no subsequent, because the fear was um, that yeah. they were going to ban a certain type, which would then ostracize either end of the spectrum, you know, and they would say, if you wanted the floppy head, that's it. You can't, you're not allowed. And if you wanted the extreme head, no, you're not allowed. Only the people that can achieve the middle road or want that will 
that will um, train their dogs to work in this manner are allowed to compete. And, and uh, you know, that was the misconception that there was a bias towards um, ousting or getting rid of a certain type. Two, that's two of the big problems with research is um, when you're, because when you're first doing the research, you don't really know what you're going to find. Yeah. Um, and so there's only so much you can say, but one of the, so dissemination of research, something that I'm really, really kind of not obsessed about, that's the wrong word, but I really, I think is the most important part because what happens, you do the research, you write a paper and then nobody can actually access that paper unless they're at an institution. Yeah. You'd either have to pay something bonkers, like 20 yeah. quid to read yeah. the paper, yeah. Um, which also is a scientific paper, so it, it, they're not that easy to understand yeah. um, to kind of the lay person. If you're not in, I can read papers and I have not got a clue what they're talking about. If you gave yeah. me one on some, like a field that I wasn't working in. Yeah, yeah. Um, so for me, one of the key, the main things, and I've done this for, I think, pretty much all of my papers, is that I will write for, I don't know, Dogs Today magazine or um, Agility. The Voice has picked it up a few times. I will write what we found what the re like what kind of basically i write a lay person's version uh, yeah version of it so actually it, it gets up because also what is the point in doing research if the people who are interested in it don't get it and that's Absolutely. that is a massive barrier yeah. in research full stop but particularly in the dog world as it stands absolutely in my so coming back to saying about research so uh, you know, on, on that study and others, I think that, like you say, make, putting that, the, the data, the evidence of the conclusions in a way that ostracizes the audience, to me, is counterproductive and counterintuitive. If, you, if you're saying that we're looking into something that relates to what you do, whether it's jump height or hill work, surely you want to then say to people and allow them to then draw their own conclusions and say, yeah, you know, I'm, um, you know, I'm potentially putting my dog at risk if I jump it at 3.6 at this height there is more risk than if I uh, jump it at five meters with this height and and the, the thing is to give them then the power of choice if they say do you know what my dog's skilled enough it's trained enough I'm happy I've done the proprietary work I'm happy to put, run my dog on this course knowing that information um, that's a, a place position going to put them in a position of confidence and, and hopefully um, being informed same with heel work if if the conclusion is most people aspire to train their dog to work in that middle bracket. And actually the extreme on either end is probably the lesser um, uh, favored position. If, and therefore let's just continue aiming for that, you know, can allow people to do because actually the extremities in both ends actually isn't so pronounced as is the misconception. Great. Let's just carry on. And, and, and that's the yeah. thing to conclude, isn't it? Um, it's, um, interestingly, so the dog walk has been lowered in recent years in agility um because of the risk of injury if dogs especially now running dog walks are so prevalent um the the risk of injury if dogs come off at the top of that dog walk at full-on like gallop sprint yeah they're gonna come a cropper yeah. so it's, i can't think what it's dropped to i can't remember what it was and what it's dropped to but i um i know someone who's a very good statistician um a math person and he ran the numbers of going on average speed of those dogs doing that thing the weight of an average border collie yeah. And then he changed the height. And there is a difference in the force that they will feel when they hit the ground. But he's, he likened it. He said it's like being hit around the face with a mallet or a shovel. Take your pick. Both are going to hurt and you're going to come a cropper. Yeah. So it's an interesting... And that's where sometimes we can make changes that actually aren't scientifically... Oh, yeah. If your dog is doing a running dog walk at full-on gallop and it comes off, yeah. it doesn't make much difference. Well, it makes no difference, really. Yeah. If it's 40 centimetres high or whatever the difference was... Yeah if it comes off it's in problems so then you have to make your own calculations of is it worth training a running dog walk because if it comes off it doesn't matter how it would have to be really low yeah. for the dog not to potentially yeah. injure itself yeah. because yeah. of the speed yeah um and that's and but that's where that's in that individual and there's no right or wrong yeah absolutely. Um, it's your individual choice i think that's the thing about studies isn't it i mean that's why is um, having the, the power of um, information and therefore subsequently choice, so people can make their own uh, um, oh, excuse me. So people can make their own conclusion about um, how they want to take their training, and therefore, and also like you know the choices they make, how they, what courses they run their dog on, what venues they attend, you know what hill, what position they have with their dog. That's the great thing, and I think that you know what science allows us is is uh, information which we can you know allow to steer choices 
my, the, the thing that I've always felt about um, some of the studies that are completed is it's a shame that, you know, there, there's very much a divide, isn't there, between, let's just say, people more in a, um, a clinical slash education, how would you define that as a, as a, a government? Um, so more of like behaviorist, a clinically based behaviorist, um, let, people like yourself, and hands-on practical dog trainers and it's a shame that there isn't more dialogue and conversation between both entities because there is so much overlap um between the two industries it's like conclusions that have, you know these i read a paper recently about i can't even remember what it was this profound ta-da you know we found that we've done this study and we've um we've concluded that i don't know when you give a dog a tip it it's yeah. more likely to do well, something. I mean, it wasn't that, but just an example. And you know, the practical dog trainers are going like, "Is that really? We we would like we've known that for decades." And it's a shame there isn't more conversation. You know, and and the thing is, we can both help each other. You know, the the people that are more hands on can learn so much and allow science to cheat the system because science and data is going to help you train your dog more effectively. And the same vein the practical dog trainers are going to say, listen, we can tell you this is going to be the outcome of your study. Yeah. I, Put your I, resources and effort into more productive yeah, yeah. things. Yeah. And I think there's also an element of, so I think I, it was possibly the first ever time I met you was at kind of KCI years ago. We were in yeah. someone's garden and all the dogs were out. So there are probably about 15 dogs in the garden and you sat down and every single dog just came and gave you their full attention. You didn't say a word but all the dogs were doing something for you. I think with, without uttering a sound, all the dogs were sitting and waiting patiently and you rewarded them at perfect timings. And I remember being like, bloody hell. And I think there's an innate ability. And it's funny, actually, I've got a student at the moment and I watched them the other day training. They've never handled a dog, actually. Um, it's the first time they've handled a dog full stop. Well, pretty much, but particularly within training. And their innate timing and ability of knowing when to talk, when to shut up, yeah. how to be, I was like, mm, you're one to watch because yeah. instinctively you've yeah. got it. And I, people sometimes ask me like, oh, what do you look for in a trainer? So coming back to that one. And for me, it's not qualifications or experience weighing out either the other. I always think go with your gut. Mm. And if that person holistically makes you feel good yeah. and makes you feel like they want to achieve yeah. you're going to do brilliantly i went on a craig a gilby day is that how you say it, sir? Ogilvy. Yeah. Ogilvy, yeah. um and i was blown away i was blown away so on paper i've got higher levels of qualifications in his ability to yeah. teach he absolutely would floor me yeah. as in he like incredible and i think that's where as if you can't go wrong if you go to somebody who is respectful and kind fundamentally to both people and animals but also if you come away feeling like oh my god that was amazing i've also been on training days where i've come away felt horrendous thought i may as well give all of this up i can't do anything i'm absolutely defeated avoid them i don't care how what their experience or qualifications are go with people who make you feel like you can achieve and i think that for me is the key that's a really, really interesting point and, um, and, and one that absolutely, so I just want to expand on. I would say, actually, there is a place for both. And from, in my experience, I think that somebody that has practical hands on knowledge, that has a really comprehensive understanding of the science is probably going to be your best bet. And I'm a stickler for, it might be a little bit, you know, I suppose a bit old school, but I'm very much proof of the puddings in the eating. I want to see them train a dog. I want to see them train several dogs and I want to see what they do with that dog uh, and not necessarily in sports. There's some uh, dog trainers that are absolutely phenomenal dog trainers, never have trained a dog for sport in their whole life that I would absolutely say that person is somebody to learn from and glean, glean from. Um, absolutely. There's a, there's a guy up in North London, phenomenal, phenomenal dog trainer. Um, and, and he, you know, um, I believe he does to be fair, he has a, a good science background, but he's, practical application of dog training is exemplary and there is people that have never ever read a book about dog training that are absolutely amazing and there's people that are have a brilliant science based and they're you know so there is something in there for everybody my personal opinion is to find somebody that has a good understanding of the science has a good hands on practical and also has a, you know can walk the walk and talk the talk you know that's my three tri the trifecta i would look for can they do it themselves 
can they understand the science and also um do they have practical experience because i think then it make i think it gives them a more that in itself for me personally i can relate to the person i can show you um technically how to do it or sorry i can show you physically how to do it and i can technically explain to you and i think certainly from a learning style if you can cover all those three bases you're going to help the person learn effectively yeah, yeah. And I think, and I, like you were saying, knowing trainers who don't, aren't in dog sports at all, um, I know an incredible trainer and they've got the most impulsive, in, like their dog is the most impulsive character you could ever come across. And yet their dog's ability to live a normal life, as in it now can walk calmly, nicely on a lead. And yet for eight months, that dog was like lunging on the end of a lead, just because it was so, not get trying to, just was so excited about life. Yeah. And that for me... I look at, yeah, how have you changed that dog for who you would need it to be? And actually that for me is really important. Yeah, absolutely. So just going on to the, um, the discussion, which we actually, so um, how this conversation come about is Em approached me post my um, talk on the winter summit um, by empowered dogs, which was on frustration, frustration, blah, 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 put my teeth back in stress and frustration resilience. And um, we're tentatively, talking in the midst of very very early about looking into that from both the dog training and obviously with both the young parents and how many parallels there are um so do you just want to give people a little bit of insight about your thinking and how that conversation went yeah so that conversation and i think just on a side note as well and i, I meant to mention earlier when you're saying there's a middle ground we know that with children that to nurture kind of resilient and and um confident children you don't want the really extreme authoritarian you do as I do because I'm your parent and you must do it but you also don't want the really submissive or you can do what you want you need this person who has boundaries and they are clear and they are calm and they're consistent because I think everyone thinks to put in boundaries you have to be horrible but absolutely. you absolutely don't um but that kind of came on so since I've had a child I've done a lot more kind of reading into child psychology that sort of stuff and I find it fascinating and one of the things that is really common knowledge within the child world is how intrinsic motivation is decreased by extrinsic reinforcement so basically your desire to do something innately is actually decreased if you're given an external something for it so your child is less likely it's harder to potty train if you give them a sweetie every time they go for a wee on the toilet because actually they'll want to up the stakes well i got a sweetie last time now i want two sweeties or whatever but actually if you work with intrinsic motivation of oh does that make your bladder feel more comfortable or whatever that actually is much more that teach that's lifelong learning basically and i suddenly thought mm, this is definitely something we want to look at in dogs because all of what we're teaching and all of what we're training is extrinsic reinforcement yeah, yeah. really interesting so recently I, I and one of the points that i was discussing with them was um recently i had a dog in for training a, a cocker spaniel lovely little dog called bramble really really sweet dog and one of the things that the sheep that the owners had asked me to train was the dog to go to bed and uh, again i initially approached it like i would order uh, any other dog um the dog goes to a bed shaped her to go to a bed give her a treat hallelujah great and i very very quickly noted in very few reps that actually the treat was undoing the dog's calmness and ability to just relax in the bed so what they wanted her to do was just to essentially go to a bed and relax whilst they were eating their dinner and every time i gave the dog a treat it would put me back to ground to uh, back to ground zero in that the dog would be over aroused and over stimulated and she would be all hyped up with the prospect of food being present and how i trained that dog to go to bed was she'd go into bed i may or may not give her a little stroke on the head and i'd sit down and she'd get out of bed and i'd put her back in the bed and i'd repeat this and say oh well done good girl that was it i didn't use any food i didn't use any toys and within the so again i videoed a couple of sessions with where um just as a part of um, feedback to the owner and you could see the difference between the dog being trained with food she was all like eyes on stalks like waiting for reinforcement and all animated versus good girl well done that was it and the difference was night and day and for for to be truthful most people with domestic dogs they don't want their dog's eyes on stikes going oh gosh what are we going to do next they want the dog to go okay i've been sent to bed go to sleep unwind so now okay i accept that that might affect the way in which you train it but if you looked at the dog, if I po posted two little pictures, 
you would look which one's the dog that's the happy content dog the dog that's fetching out relaxed sleeping or the dogs that's eyes on stalks waiting like semi vibrating um with the prospect of getting a treat yeah totally and i think um so i was giving an example of a friend whose dog was really foody loved food um and he's a real hunter though is a gun dog and absolutely loves to go hunt for pheasants um has done loads of work on recall um but has now got to a point where if there are pheasants around dog will not eat food and it, the dog isn't that over aroused it's not a case of actually this dog is so super over aroused it can't eat at this moment of time i think there's a factor of well i don't want your food because it means nothing right now because actually it's almost the food has become a precursor for me not getting yeah. the pheasants yeah. and i suppose likening that going to bed when we go to bed at night i sure as hell don't go to bed because someone's re rewarded me for it i go to bed because i know it's going to be cozy it's going to be nice it's going to be comfortable and all the things that i'm intrinsically motivated to do that's why i go to bed yeah. um and that whole there's a really smart so um helen zulch actually yeah. um one of the big things that she was saying about loose lead walking is it's waiting for that dog to be really like oh okay yeah. well this is a bit more boring yeah. because loose lead walking isn't about being like this on the yeah. side of your lead like oh my god we're doing something yeah. it's about mooching and ambling and yeah. it's way slower and it's a totally different frame of mind that whole yeah waiting on your bed with eyes on stalks yeah. quivering for the next thing to happen or waiting on your bed and having a snooze yeah absolutely and and just uh, before we draw things for close is it's really interesting that certainly for sports so one of the one of the discussions that em and i were having was one of the parts of the conversation was about the parallels between sheep dog herding dogs versus sports dogs and if, if in my opinion the herding dog is the dog that works in total drive where they can literally you will go to a sheep dog trial and you will see the international supreme champion curled up waiting whilst other dogs are doing their herding bit and he might lift his head now and again uh, you know and show a little bit casual interest but largely he's just hanging out and then you know his person goes to his bailing twine and unravels him and saunters over to the start peg and the dog changes and it becomes stoic and still and poised and then they wait with a deadly level of focus the person gives the cue wham the dog takes off 100 miles an hour up the field to find the sheep as opposed to you go to a you know i'm going to pick on agility or agility or a high energy sport like that and you've got collies baying like wolves and people on halties and harnesses and this harness and that and, and with leads and trying to like as if they're cujo trying to get them to ringside and the parallel between the two things and the misunderstanding that you know that dog has never received a tidbit for going to find the sheep or to lying down there was that intrinsic you know wait your turn dog etc and and a lot i think there's a there's something to be explored which is what we're discussing about have we almost gone down this this path of reinforcement based dog training and largely created some of the issues which is going to be a very interesting thing to look at and i i do i will never forget going to the foot my first ever sheep and being like what like what is what are all these dogs doing literally just yeah. lined up sleeping and I, I mean imagine if you tied agility dogs up without their owners yeah. all in close proximity watching a ring there'd be fights left right and center yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah and you know those are the same they're the same dogs they're all board collies they're all the same you know genetic they all go back to whisk and cap so you you wonder what we've 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 as sports practitioners what we've done and, and what have we, the application of reinforcement based drug training, what have we done that's actually largely created some of our problems? But that's going to be for another day and another conversation, and hopefully, what we're going to be looking into. Em, it's been fascinating talking to you, super, super interesting. Thank you very much for your time. Um, when is your baby due? February, beginning okay. of. All right, so best of luck. And you've got lots of Christmas plans? Absolutely none, apart from hopefully relax a little bit. <laughs> right. Impossible with a toddler, I think. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you. It's been fantastic. Really, really interesting. All the best. Have a great Christmas with your family and best of luck with your baby and hopefully speak soon. Bye. Bye.